Hey, NP listener. This is Matt. And today on the show, we're actually going to be focusing more on a conversation uh, around unpacking, learning, and growing while also recognizing our own bias as an all white podcast. Um, we felt that it's important to talk about what's going on in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests. And though we're a small Nintendo fandom podcast, we recognize that as an all white group, we have our own biases to unpack. And we also still feel like these are important conversations that we need to be having, that we have a responsibility to have. And so we hope you'll lean in with us as we have this conversation. So we'll start with an official statement from us at AMP and then jump right in. Thanks for listening. Hi, we're the hosts of another Nintendo podcast, and we stand with the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests in the wake of the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and other instances of violence toward Black communities perpetuated by systemic racism and law enforcement. As white people, we recognize our privilege and are working individually and as a podcast to name and confront biases we each hold. We know we have a lot to learn. Each of us, perhaps like many of you, are finding ways to give back, show up, and do necessary work to make sure we're being positive agents of change. In this podcast, we'll be sharing some of the steps we're taking to educate ourselves to be productive allies of the Black Lives Matter movement. Our podcast may be small, but we felt it important to take a moment to use this platform and put our love of gaming in context. How is the gaming community responding? How are we responding individually? And what are we committing to as a podcast? All right. So as you heard in our intro, um, today we wanted to take some time to discuss um, the protests that are happening um, all around the world um, and uh, express our support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and we wanted to do that in a way where we can talk about how um, Nintendo and the larger gaming community is responding um, kind of put our regular focus of the show in context with this with this movement. Um, so we'll take some time to discuss that, and then we'll jump into what each of us um, is doing individually and what we'll be committing to moving forward as a podcast. Um, so um, as you may know, if you're listening, my name is Jordan Weiner, and I am joined by several other lovely co-hosts. If you just want to just introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Matt Schultz. I'm Austin Cummings. And I'm Danny Tortelli. Great. Um, so to start, Nintendo of America released uh, their statement in response to the protests and the death of George Floyd on June 3rd. Um, so I thought we could start by just reading what that statement was and then kind of uh, reacting to it here um, and talking about how other gaming um, companies have responded as well. So this was a statement yeah. from Nintendo of America. Nintendo shares the pain felt in the United States after the tragic death of George Floyd. And we stand with the black community and all those who recognize our shared humanity and fundamental belief in equity and justice. We reject bias, exclusion, oppression, and the violence that leads to these completely unnecessary deaths. We are committed to fostering equity, inclusion, and diversity in all aspects of our business and the work we do. Um, how did you guys feel with this response from Nintendo of America and just more broadly the response from the gaming community? Yeah, I think uh, so. Some of the conversations we had before recording were looking at what we saw out of some of these outlets as, you know, what we like and ways in which we would like to see some of these companies push further. You know, I'm glad to see uh, Nintendo out there making a statement, but like many of these others, I wish it were more specific. Especially from a company sometimes that we feel um, kind of focused, uh, like in Japan and then the other parts of the company kind of like things kind of trickle to other parts of the world um you know to nintendo of america nintendo of europe you mm -hmm. know canada so it was good to see this and but also you know they they kind of at the very end name that we've been committed to x y and z but it would be nice to know internally what kind of conversations are happening um you know and is nintendo giving or trying to address this particular issue or name the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, 
don't know, more directly, like we've seen with some some other companies. And then Nintendo notoriously kind of keeps that stuff on like as a, as an internal and they aren't trying to advertise what ways they're they're giving. But maybe yeah. it's the time to do that. Yeah, I think it's the time to do yeah. that for sure. I think that's kind of all of our joint reactions and how we've kind of talked about it in the show notes. Just um, we want to see, yeah, companies really take a hold of this uh, extremely important global moment. Everyone has responsibility. And I think these companies have such a big platform and fan base, such as, uh, you know, those of us here that it's it's I think when they take a stand, it encourages their fans to take a stand. And as we know from the from the gamers, they can really run the gambit of fine to terrible. And so <laughs> with that in mind, I think seeing it as a, a the symbol of companies taking action is really important. Yeah, um, I I often view Nintendo on very similar terms as Disney as far as a company, you know, always focused on the family. And I appreciated when Disney put out their statement, you know, they immediately said, here's what we're currently doing. You know, here's the donations we're making right now. Um, and I, I do hope they come out and they say that like, you know, we said this the other day and we're standing behind it by doing blank. Like Matt said, like, what are the actions currently? Not the, well, we have done and let's pat ourselves on the back, you know, sort of response. But, yeah, this is the moment, and I and I hope they they seize that and they they join in productively. Yeah, I was reading a couple of articles reacting to this and on statements from other companies, and um, one thing that a bunch of them pointed out is where were these statements from gaming, the gaming industry, but also from like other um, industries uh, back when the Black Lives Matter movement started. Where were mm-hmm. they during mm-hmm. Ferguson, during other important um, social justice issues that we've confronted as a country or worldwide? And and cynically, like these are all large companies, like definitely a, a portion of their response is always going to be from the standpoint of like, how is what's our image? Like, how is this going to help us with consumers? But I agree that I would really like to see them at, at minimum, like committing to a monetary donation and doing that very visibly, but then like committing to um, what they're actually doing with employees of their organization, um, knowing that communities of color are not well represented um, in like the gaming industry in the United States. Um, you know, what are they doing to work on that and recruitment in their own organization? How are they looking in internally? Do they have resource groups for employees from different identity backgrounds? Um, you know, do they have a diversity and inclusion initiative? Are there people at the company who are focused on these issues? Um, I think it would be really powerful to see like a lot more public information about that. Um, Cause it could be a good role model for other companies to follow too. Which is fascinating for a company we seem to know little about in terms of corporate culture, even at Nintendo of America. Um, it would be so great to know those things. It would be great to hear from, and maybe if you followed, like, I know if you follow Bill Trinan on Twitter, you'll, you'll definitely get his personal take on everything. Mm-hmm. It would just be so great to, to hear that more from other prominent Nintendo Treehouse folks. Um, you know, the people from Nintendo Minute, how are, you know, how, you know, how are they work, you know, yeah. processing this? Like, but. And I've liked yeah. seeing their content also on Twitter. I've, you know, I like the, the right. two of them and their dynamic and they, um, you know, when you, when, especially for a company like Nintendo, when they have so few like outward facing personalities that we get a lot of exposure to, right. When you have the Nintendo Minute, that is like the closest thing they have to having some type of PR arm. And so it would be great to see something like that, or even on the Switch newsfeed, something along those lines. I would like to point to, for a company that I think has done things really well, if you guys think it's an okay time to talk about Niantic of Pokemon Go, you know, a big thing from their internal internal memo, and then uh, that that was also available uh, on Twitter. They you know, are very, very explicit with what their commitment is. So Pokemon Go Fest is an annual uh, festival, community festival, and... Um, though they've had to kind of reshuffle some of those events this year because of coronavirus, they are still uh, one of their commitments are, and I'm just going to read it. We'll be donating Niantic proceeds for Pokemon Go Fest 2020 ticket sales, committing a minimum of $5 million, which is uh, certainly one of the higher numbers I've seen uh, mm-hmm. people or any company really offer to suggest. I believe that is what Disney is suggesting. There's a number of things. We'll put this link in our show notes for people who want to read more about what their commitment is, but they are creating an accountability committee to have some oversight on these commitments to make sure that uh, that the policies that they are describing here are actually implemented meaningfully and that people will be there to hold them accountable to it. And also there's certain forward-looking investments they're making knowing to increase the level of diversity uh, in their 
they want their platform and their company and their creatives going forward. And so some of that is, let's say, upping their commitment to Treehouse, which in this case is an organization dedicated to diversifying tech by educating, uh, by making education more accessible and also educating more uh, children's programs. And their final portion of this is lastly, we take a uh, public stance and support the black community and reject white supremacy, racism, and police brutality. And then it provides links for Black Lives Matter movement and things of that nature. So it's very, very thorough and uh, very clear. And as a Pokemon Go player, uh, Niantic is not always this uh, transparent. So it is especially nice to see that when there's something especially important, um, more important than all the fun gold uh, events that we Pokemon Go players experience, that they did have a large commitment and they really prioritized this. And I think that is the type of thing that I like to see as somebody who utilizes their product. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's glad to hear they're, they're showing up and they're not, yeah, they're, they're being present. I wanted to just kind of jump back really quick. We, Reggie has spoken out on a few things most recently, um, you know, around, around gun violence and video games. And he was really passionate about debunking you know, a lot of the myths around how video games have contributed and trying to make real change in the area of gun reform. Uh, well, on his Twitter account, he, he, he posted uh, a fourth episode of Talking Games with Reggie and Harold. Um, I've, I don't know about this podcast, but hmm. um, Harold is a writer for NPR and a few other things, New York Magazine. He retweeted the podcast like link, but also wrote, listen until the very end. Uh, then take on the challenge that Harold and I lay out. Get knowledgeable, get involved, drive change that makes a positive difference. Gaming for good. Yeah, I'd definitely be interested. Those industry leaders can make a big impact for people who pay attention. One other reaction that's been interesting, we were chatting about this a bit before recording, um, is the the reaction from the like the actual gamers. Um, so Matt, I know you've experienced this firsthand, but um, we've been reading that in Animal Crossing and Splatoon 2, um, players have been holding virtual protests, making art related to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I know for the protests in Hong Kong, Animal Crossing was also used um, as a similar kind of space. So um, I've I personally really like I found it really interesting and empowering to read about how, how fans are using these spaces, but would love to hear more about what that's looked like. Yeah, that's, that's been really interesting. So I've been, I'm either in subreddits or on Facebook groups. Um, you know, Jordan and I've both met through the same field and, and, or, uh, you know, I'm, are you in the higher ed page for like student affairs gamers? I am not. Um, (laughs) um, it's been all over that. And I've seen not only, uh designs you know in terms of like supporting black lives matter movement within the game but also people bringing people over to essentially engage their students in a way that they felt like comfortable uh, discussing their identities but also you know um exploring maybe the movement perhaps for the first time or trying to find ways to virtually protest if they're unable or um you know uncomfortable with being out in in a large group um, obviously during this time, Animal Crossing has been, uh, quite an, an escapist kind of a game. Um, mm-hmm. but it's been really interesting to see how the real world has definitely creeped in in different ways. And, and Animal Crossing is not immune to what's happening right now. And I think it's, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see, you know, these things happen and displayed in the game. Um, and also, especially for folks who feel like it's a way for, them to get involved and engage with the content and kind of begin their own journeys of unpacking, understanding, regardless of what identities they may hold. But the, at the end of the day, it's, it's nice to log into a game and know that you can't, you can't escape this right mm-hmm. now um, for better or worse, but it's, it's, I'm glad the conversation's happening, especially I've, you know, with the things around, you know, the Hong Kong, Hong Kong protests, that's been, that's been really interesting to see uh, and read of how people are, using you know their animal crossing villages and patterns yeah just as like a lifeline in order to communicate with one another and to Mm -hmm. rally uh, you know against their extremely oppressive government there as a way to communicate with an internet that's otherwise almost entirely on lockdown um Mm -hmm. yeah that has been uh, a sobering and inspiring thing to observe yeah i think something you said matt and then we'd all been talking about too i think um for some people, video games are largely this like escapist place of, oh, I don't want to think about what's going on in real life. Real life is stressful. Um, 
video games are my space where I can get away from all that. And you can replace video games with like any number of, of hobbies. Right. And I think one of the, the most important things that I've been trying to communicate to the communities that I'm a part of, um, especially as a person who's white uh, with a, with a lot of privilege is like, it's privileged to feel like you have the ability to escape um, into somewhere and to not think about this. Um, and ultimately games, um, especially games that have this online interaction component are a space for player expression. And this is very real for so many people. Um, and if it's not, uh, real for you, it means that you have some level of privilege in this situation. So, um, I think that's such an important thing to discuss is like that tension between like, oh, how do I escape and get away from all of this? But also not everyone has, uh, the ability to, to do that. Um, Mm-hmm. which yeah, is exactly. so important to yeah. recognize yeah if you have that uh means by which to seek escape then you have more means to take responsibility and try to be part of affecting change and i think that one of the biggest things that's come out of this uh past couple of weeks um has been a sense of people trying to pull together to drown out the negative voices whether it's you know k-pop stands on twitter or it's people just trying to um, make sure, you know, not, don't give anyone an inch for, you know, there's, there are no two sides to, uh, this argument, whether it's, um, you know, and though some of it maybe feels generational, whether it's, um, you know, people you in- encounter just out, out in the world, or perhaps it's family or someone you work with or whomever. Um, but you know, those are just excuses that we give them to, um, you know, to have bad opinions. And I've, it's important to call all of ourselves and others on those bad opinions and know that the there's you know not two sides to any of this it's police murdering black people and there's uh there's no other side to the matter to stay educated and to stay active and to stay uh frustrated and passionate about speaking for those who are not able to take that time to escape or who want to you know who cannot protest because there's a much greater fear of their being arrested or killed no, or not right. or have been forced into a socioeconomic class that they cannot take the you know day off or weekend off or have family responsibilities or what have you that are what you know do not give them the hours to that's been on a personal note, yeah, like I know for me, like I've had like you know Danny and I will play some super Smash Brothers, um and we've brought this up on other podcasts like they're during you know the kind of the covid era at the moment. Like I, I've had to really push myself. Like, like I've had a lot of moments this week where I've wanted to escape, and it's very easy for me, both as a as a white male employed, you know, in the neighborhood I specifically live in here in the city. Like, it's really easy to check out and invest in whiteness versus divesting from it. And I think for me that that's been a struggle, and I've had to like kind of pause myself in moments and think about those exact things of why. You know, why, why do I want to pour hours into Animal Crossing right now? And it's both, you know, and, and how do I keep myself from it instead of making sure I'm using my time in a way that I feel might be a more, more responsible way to be using it. And everyone is different, and I've, I know I've struggled with it, and I think it's, it's important to recognize, you know, that doing the work for, you know, your self-work to ensure your ensuring you know that you're contributing to a more just world both within your sphere of influence and beyond is means that you have to recognize what your limitations are and in the moment and ensure you're doing that taking the time to self-care and and that's me as a white person saying that you know obviously imagine what individuals of color specifically black people black gamers are experiencing right now and i kind of you know i struggle and balance of like how much can i can i escape right now am i going to allow myself to um, but I think that's a, a, something for everyone to a, ask themselves. And also, um, you know, there's, there's no right answer to that. And I think a lot of people both need that space and need to divest from it a little bit to focus on what's happening. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I know in a moment we'll share some of our thoughts as to resources we've, um, been impacted by, uh, and affected by everyone needs to own uh, where their level of privilege and that their experience is not that of the, uh, for white Americans, that of the the black experience and the uh, having, you know, it doesn't mean you have to necessarily uh, feel shame for it. You know, you don't, but it's important to acknowledge it 
uh, because only you know through that are you going to be actual able to make any impactful improvements in the lives of the people that need need this help. Um, but you do have a responsibility to do that. If you have the option, then you have a responsibility. Yeah, so maybe that's a good transition into talking about steps that each of us are taking, resources that we found um, valuable. Um, as we've all been saying, I think that the, the response looks really different from person to person. Um, and um, while some people may be attending protests, other people may be engaging in different resources to educate themselves or donating or signing petitions, I think there are a variety of different ways to get involved. And so um, in case it's helpful to anyone else and just just for ourselves, I'm curious to hear what you all have been up to. But um, yeah, let's take a minute to to share what we've we've all been doing. Um, I'm happy to start um, and mm-hmm. we'll share all these resources in the show notes, too, and, and links to everything. Um, one thing that I've been reading that I found really valuable is uh, this book, The End of Policing by Alex Vitale. Um, this book came out in 2017 and it's actually available for free. You can get the ebook um, completely free from the publisher, Verso Books. Um, I saw this shared online and um, downloaded it and I'm only a couple of chapters in, so I can't speak to the whole book. But um, one thing that that I've personally struggled with um, in this movement is like very much agreeing with the movement, but not quite grasping what it would really mean to defund the police. Like what does the future look like? Um, um, and what tangible demands make sense? Um, uh, and that's something that I really wanted to learn more about, um, because I knew that it was something that I couldn't quite grasp and I felt inauthentic, like sharing resources about defunding the police, but I didn't really understand what that meant. So, um, reading this book has been a step that I've been taking to try and really understand like, what are the, the, systemic issues with the police as it stands right now and why um, a lot of reforms that I think have been tossed around, especially over the last couple of years, why reform may not be the answer, but actually like defunding the police and investing resources elsewhere would would um, make a lot more sense and have a lot more impact on communities. Um, so I found that resource really valuable. I've been doing a lot of reading um, and I'm happy to, to share more um, books and articles and things like that that I've been reading too. Um, and then I, I, uh, recently moved to Seattle. So, uh, my partner and I have been doing research on local organizations that we can donate to and support. And we've made a commitment to put aside some money each month to donate to a different local organization, um, so that we can get more involved. I think if things were different, we would be, um, interested in like actually going out and volunteering. So we want to know where we can be involved and then hopefully in the future, like, uh, physically volunteer, um, in a, in a post COVID uh, situation. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think that's been heartening for me to see the talk of defunding the police and the enthusiasm behind it and the uh, response of Minneapolis. And I think it's been educational for myself. And when I've shared it with others, uh, the importance in there, you know, I think that there's a lot of education that people uh, will be exposed to and will hopefully uh, challenge themselves to expose themselves to, to figure out, you know, what does that look like? What does the budget that currently goes into the police? We see them all over Twitter in these, uh, you know, crazy Robotech outfits. Um, there's been these great Twitter parallels of the right gear matched, you know, juxtaposed to that of healthcare workers uh, wearing their mm-hmm. trash bags and just the amount of money and, uh, you know, scarcity of, of hours that goes into the uh, police uh, education and uh, funding. And, you know, how can this be redirected to all other, many other meaningful social works, as well as just the concept of, uh, the number of things that police are responsible for mm-hmm. responding to that go lo- far, far beyond that of, uh, you know, being these, I think, self-conceived uh, warriors, you know, out on the road uh, that are in. But the number of calls that police have to deal with that they are just not simply untrained for, you know, all this that would be much more effective with a skilled social worker or, um, you know, mediator or someone to defuse a situation than uh, these people that just are out of their element. It's just not a good fit for them and is not why. They likely enrolled in the force or, uh, you know, maybe when people think at a young age being a police officer, they don't think of going to settle domestic disputes, uh, you know, or uh, locate uh, a misplaced item. You know, these are that is not the concept, but it is a responsibility of the of a system that has poured a lot of money into uh, placing people into really ill fitting roles. That is, uh, I think, learning about defunding and the role of police and the ways in which they can change is a good way people should challenge myself would challenge themselves 
yeah, this moment has really challenged me to like step back and think about the police, something that I really, uh, again, have been privileged to just kind of accept as the, the status quo. I think like, um, just speaking for myself personally, like growing up in a predominantly, uh, white upper middle class neighborhood, like growing up in the era that we grew up, which was like post all of this, like militarization of the police, like the war on drugs, all these things that really contributed to changing right. police culture in this country. I think I just kind of grew up with a, uh, kind of status quo understanding of the police or like, Oh, like at any time in danger, you always call 911. Like yeah, the police are there to, not, they're there to help right, you. Exactly. Um, and right. so, um, well, like through my involvement in different diversity and inclusion and social justice, um, organizations through work and personally, uh, you know, as I've grown up, have been challenged to think about that, but this moment, especially in, in, in reading this book has, um, really helped me, uh, deconstruct that. And like, um, that's been, that's been really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, you know, all the rhetoric of like, well, we need police that is exclusively a white thought. I've been exercising a lot throughout COVID. And so, and a part of that has always been podcast, audiobooks. You know, I actually, I enjoy listening to other people think. Uh, so I was looking initially to, to podcasts and uh, a friend recommended uh, 1619 to me from the New York Times, um, which has anyone, has anyone had a chance to listen? No. Um, mm-hmm. basically, it basically is, is an entire podcast dedicated to kind of unpacking how slavery has not only began, but how kind of it, what its long lasting effects meant for the America we see today. And each, each podcast uh, episode kind of unpacks that just a little bit more um, and explores everything from um, you kind of, you know, uh, entertainment to you know pol- it, it does get into policing um to the healthcare system um and and beyond and uh documentaries both on netflix and beyond uh just mercy is free everywhere right now yeah it's on amazon it's on google i i have not had a chance to watch it yet but i'm looking i know it's really well received i love michael Beach, a great i think entry way to maybe expose somebody to some of the concepts and you know, a form factor that they're familiar with being that to sit down and watch a movie and we can get people together to watch a movie and maybe simulate some of that thought. It's nice. They've made that available. 13th on Netflix is a fantastic documentary around systemic racism and how that, how that's shown up throughout history, um, specifically American history with the war on drugs, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, 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 it eerily, you know, you know, jumps, it ends right with, you know, kind of, you know, Trump's early years. Um, and it's, it's an interesting film to watch given how it ends and the call to action and, and asking like, what will it take to finally move the needle on this? And this is before, you know, I mean, this is after Ferguson, but also before what we're seeing today. And it's, it's, it's eerie to watch, but it's, it's important. I've been taking the time as I'm sure a lot of us have, um, just to find, ways to support, um, you know, if, if you can't always march, um, to just, uh, push the needle as far as, you know, donating, um, as far as the signing petitions and stuff like that. Um, recently there's a page I found that has a nice conglomeration of a lot of the mutual aid, uh, funds, um, uh, that, you know, a lot of numbers kind of been going to helping with, um, the bailout funds and whatnot. And, and those are good. And, and they need to keep coming, um, for the protesters, especially who are, um, getting arrested for other nothing other than just uh voicing their concern as as the right we have in this country. Um a lot of those have received quite a bit of funds, so now, you know, mutual aid networks are ways to you know, how else can we help out a lot of these um these areas, these communities, these uh you know, ways we can directly help people who are, you know, have been feeling this uh burden even well before the past couple months, you know, because as we know, this has just been stuff that's unfortunately been around for a long time. Um, so mutual aid networks, a couple I found, um, again, we'll include the link here. Um, just like you guys said, just trying to listen and read, um, as best I can just to learn more about, you know, we're talking a lot about this as far as, uh, police brutality, um, which is very, uh, prescient right now and needs to be talked about, but also where else in society has this, the answer is a lot and pretty much everywhere. But, you know, where else in society has this has this kind of spread to and where um, does it need to be addressed? Um, you know, we talk about it needs to be addressed everywhere. The gaming industry, you know, 
um, pretty much any industry, any workplace mm -hmm. um, in the home as well. Um, some helpful videos I found um, a couple of years ago just help start explaining a lot, um, especially as a privileged white guy, similar, grew up in uh, upper middle class, uh, predominantly white neighborhoods. You know, a lot of the stuff is uh, I'm, I'm of the uninitiated um, as far as my raising and upbringing. So there's a couple of videos. There's a channel on YouTube um, by Fr Francesca Ramsey and MTV. It's called Decoded. And they break down a lot of um, the systemic racisms and uh, just across our, our world. Um, so I think it's just a great way. You know, it's you know endearing and heartfelt and and funny. Um, it is funny, um, but it's a great way to just spell out where how we got here um, and where a lot of these isms and phobias have come from, and um, you know what are ways to maybe start dismantling them. So. Yeah, those are some other resources that we'll, we'll share as mine, yeah, too. I think that's a good point, Daniel, it's just with the humor. You know, we all have different types of friends and people that are going to respond differently to different resources. And uh, humor can be a great way of breaking down a concern or a barrier that might prevent somebody from uh, taking a look at the situation quick. A shout out for three different resources that I've uh, really uh, been impressed by. And so the so if, if it speaks to one of them speaks to you or all three of them. Uh, but the first being uh, Min Max is a uh, podcast that I really enjoy. It started in 2019. It's former Game Informer employees uh, after there was a bunch of layoffs when they were uh, through GameStop last year. Uh, one of the one of the individuals of Game Informer left uh, the company at that time to start this podcast. It's in Minneapolis. And uh, so Min Max, and that's with two N's. And it's really a, a clever and fun and in-depth uh, podcast. But they started, they did a fundraiser that's raised over $15,000, which is great for this uh, very small uh, podcast effort that's still very new uh, to help rebuild Minneapolis. And earlier this week, they also did a live stream game show with some people from uh, GameSpot and took different trivia questions and people could just make pledges and donations. A, a nice way to see that gaming community come together. But if you're interested in that, Ben Hansen is the uh, founder of MinMax. And so check out the podcast, but also... They help a bit rebuild Minneapolis. Uh, Go fund me. Another resource I want to talk about is um, I love comics. And so if uh, any of you also are into Marvel comics, someone who had been tapped uh, a number of years ago is uh, Tennessee Coates, uh, who, who was tapped to write Black Panther. Uh, and then more recently, he wrote a second run of Black Panther and Captain America uh, during one of the more recent Marvel relaunches. And um, Tennessee Coates, he uh had was a writer for the atlantic and also uh has written a number of books and he has a really distinct voice and um there's a a definite kind of poetry and lyricism to his voice check it out on audible and also if you're just interested in learning more about this writer there's a very good ezra klein episode uh from last week where ezra klein and tennessee Coates uh discussed the black lives matter movement but what i was going to say is if you like comics you might check out some of his works the first Captain America volume is free right now in comics all his comics. He writes about power struggle and representation and, uh, dissent and, uh, kind of authoritarianism. And the very last thing I want to point to is an experience I had last night, which is on Oculus, the uh, VR headset, but you can also view it on the New York times. It's called traveling while black. It is a 20 minute kind of three, uh, three-dimensional or 360 degrees, I suppose, uh, documentary featurette that the New York Times put together. And it talks about the Green Book and uh, traveling while black uh, in the time of segregation and links it up into the murder of Tamir Rice. And it takes you through whether it's riding on the bus or train or speaking to people who were uh, alive wow. for utilizing the Green Book. It all takes place for the most part in um, it's using live footage. So you're sitting there and you can look all the way around. Um, but that's the extent of the interaction. But it, it, you sit in a diner that was a, um, that was a Green Book safe haven for black Americans during the time of the Green Book. And then it also includes uh, Tamir Rice's mother, who uh, speaks at kind of across from you at the table to an interviewer uh, about, and it's Samaria Rice, uh, talking about the experience and the footage of her son, Tamir Rice, you know, when he was murdered, a 12-year-old playing with a um, toy mm -hmm. gun who was killed without hesitation by police officers. Um, and uh, it's powerful, and it's also 
the first time I've had the experience behind that type of documentary uh, immersion in the form of uh, VR or again, just a 360 view, which you can do on the New York Times website just and kind of pan it around on your screen, uh, which is also very cool. So check that out. It is free. That was awesome. Awesome resources from everyone, really. I've written everything everyone has said down just now. So thank you all. I mean, I think that's my, my one call to action for all of us is to just, you know, be open to the learning and the, you know, the, the, the friction that sometimes exists there with being exposed to new ideas and new, um, new information. Um, but be open to that and, and, and willing to learn and, and pick up something, you know, you haven't, you typically, you might not, you know, look at your bookshelf, look at your podcast subscriptions and see how maybe that can change. And I know certainly for me, that's an area, you know, uh, something I'm constantly looking at and it's a good call for us all. Um, but thanks, thanks for sharing all of those things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, and then we had wanted to wrap up by talking about some commitments uh, we can make as a podcast moving forward. Um, so I think that's um, probably a good place to wrap up. Um, one thing that we've been mindful of, um, and I know I'm relatively new to the show, but speaking for the show, um, we've been we've been mindful of is um, the identities of, of us as hosts. Um, so as as we stated, um, we all identify as white. Um, we uh, are very much aware that we're not representing a diversity of perspectives um, uh, when we're talking about gaming or, or anything else. So um, a commitment that um, we've been working toward and will continue to work toward uh, more intentionally is um, featuring different voices on the show, featuring different perspectives. Um, and that may take the form of um, bringing on um, additional hosts on the show. Um, but also, as we were just talking about, just uh, diversifying the the places where we're getting information and the voices that we're uplifting when we read articles about games, when we think about games we're going to be featuring. Um, I think there are many small steps that we can take as people, but also as a podcast to think more intentionally about um, how we're broadening our perspectives and how we're thinking about different things, um, even for a topic like gaming. Yeah. I think it's great. And I really appreciate uh, you, Jordan, for uh, kind of helping to structure all of that and pull that, I think, together for us. And I, uh, I think it's an important acknowledgement that these are all uh, concepts that I you know, grew up not having to think about. And I'm uh, glad to be challenged to think about them. I, hopefully uh, our listenership is too, or might be more so, or might uh, engage with some of these links or think about what they would like to see out of companies when they respond. Uh, you know, what matters to you what is the commitment that you'd like to see companies make and what are commitments you would like to make you know for yourself and i think for us yeah finding ways to acknowledge um you know whether it be having more people on the podcast which always be lovely or just finding ways to highlight different um yeah different voices no matter the no matter the platform or maybe it's a creator and hopefully uh those avenues will get even easier as the industry at large realizes that there's an importance in recognizing uh, you know black creators or uh creators of color and um, you know, things of that nature that can help point us to, because I find even for myself playing, well, uh, some Dragon Quest Eleven last night, let me hop into the Dragon Quest Eleven story right now, which is that I was playing it and it was really, uh, lovely and has a good upbeat message for this post calamity section of the game. And I was like heartened by it, but then also there is zero characters color in the entire game. And this is the most recent, uh, iteration of that game. And I found myself spending a great deal of time last night, just digging through message boards, find out is anyone talking about this you know looking for that hopefully the game industry will continue to find ways to emphasize that we've seen a big shift i think post gamergate in the gaming world as far as a greater emphasis on female characters and a greater emphasis on uh, highlighting some of those storytellers it's still totally the minority but there's a you know they're more of an effort and i think less of a tolerance for intolerance by gamers who are you know don't felt uh, it's too political or whatever just you know they're i think we've gotten further away from that the more we're willing to challenge ourselves and discuss it and hopefully we start to see the same thing for black characters which are you know and creators highlighted again um these games are many thousands of people work on most games and um you know highlighting some of those different voices to bring out 
what is great and interesting about uh, different races and different perspectives that you will never experience if everything is just what you know. Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, I think as, as a podcast, just, you know, I think just trying to find ways to, I mean, issues of injustice happen in every facet of our society and we've seen it happen in multiple ways within the gaming community and just taking, you know, it's more of an onus on, on ourselves to focus on these stories and discuss them. I know they're not always Nintendo related, but I think it might be important for us to, to continue to give them, you know, time for, for discussion, whether people are listening or not, just to be having these conversations. Also, this is, you know, I know we discussed this a little bit, but a call to anyone listening to this podcast, our entire community, that we are 100% open to including anyone into this show. If you've listened from the very beginning, you've, you've heard lots of different people <laughs> come in and off this podcast, and that's totally, that's totally great. But we want, we want more perspectives, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to be, to be um, kind of echoed on this show. And if you're listening and you think that could be you please by all means reach out yeah you're on it um, i mean if you want in and you're heaven forbid you're a listener <laughs> you. you made this far in guess what you just you just got the, the golden ticket <laughs> the golden ticket my <laughs> son or daughter because you're on the next episode but we'd love to have yeah any engagement that way it's not a perspective i can bring so um mm-hmm. we welcome anyone who has right. something to say we'd love to have you on yeah and i think um kind of just echoing what we've said a little bit you know uh there's there's no aspect of society that does not get touched by this and um you know there's uh i think not talking about it uh moving forward is is one of those things that would not you know now's not a time for any half steps um and so you know it's it's something i know we'll all continue to talk about in our in our own circles and and however best we can you know serve that um serve this fight as we can here um i know that's something we'll we'll continue certainly to discuss here as well Keep- hold people accountable to uh, and companies accountable and things you enjoy accountable because we each need to do better and the things we enjoy need to be better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we all hold each other accountable too. So I've appreciated this conversation and I'm looking forward to continue chatting in the future and kind of updating the resources that, um, that we're all engaging in and, and having more conversations like this. Um, like I said, we'll be sharing all of the resources we've talked about in the show notes. Um, we certainly welcome um, more resources. So please um, share with us um, what you're up to um, and let us know if you're interested in uh, being on the podcast in the future. We'd, we'd love to chat with you. Um, any other thoughts today, guys? Good to go? Yeah, I think let's, yeah. let's start the podcast. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Very good. All right. It was a great conversation and, and uh, looking forward to another Nintendo podcast.